Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Jean Betsy Alshin is Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Her work on the connections between our political and ethical convictions is well known in public venues as well as in the academy. Her recent books include Who Are We? Critical Reflections, Hopeful Possibilities, and Just War Against Terror, The Burden of American Power in a Violent World. The title of Professor Elstein's paper is Why Augustine? Why Now? Professor Elstein. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank my colleague Susan Schreiner for her uh, energy in putting this conference together. Um, it is a great honor to participate in a conference honoring uh, the great David Tracy. The fate, of, the fate of St. Augustine in the world of academic political theory, political theory is the field in which I was trained, has been at best mixed. He is first of all enveloped in a blanket of suspicion cast over all religious or theological thinkers. Do they really belong with the likes of Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, Marx, Mill, Hobbes, and so on. There are as well particular features to Augustine's work that makes him a tough nut to crack. He is an ambi ambitiously discursive and narrative thinker. Although a number of his works follow an argumentative line in the manner most often favored by political theorists, given the distinctly juridical or legalistic cast of so much, much modern political theory, most often he paints bold strokes on an expansive canvas. His enterprise is at once theological, philosophical, historical, cultural, and rhetorical. His works are characterized by an extraordinary rich surface as well as vast depth making it difficult to get a handle on if one's purposes are not similarly ambitious. Given this towering enterprise, it is perhaps unsurprising that attempts have been made to reduce Augustine to manageable size. To that end, he has been tagged a political realist and canonized, if you will, as the theological grandfather of a tradition that includes Machiavelli and Hobbes. Now, there's a version of political realism that Augustine fits into, but not that kind of political realism, but that's where he's been situated. If Augustine is read at all, <laughs> is read primarily in and through excerpts from his great works that most favorably comport with situating him in the lineage that later eventuates with Machiavelli and Hobbes. To this end, his confessions are ignored, and book 19 of The City of God is reproduced with certain bits highlighted. The text is gone through and there are a few passages here and there that are cherry-picked in order that they comport with the view of Augustine as a real politiker. In the interest of time, I'll skip over the excerpts that are usually highlighted in book 19 is most often what we do for that purpose. Now the upshot is this reduced Augustine numbered among the pessimists, and charged with being one of those who stress to the exclusion of nearly everything else, human cruelty and violence, with a concomitant need for order, coercion, punishment, and war. Now, if, this, if one hopes to avoid this characterization of Augustine for political theory, what is required? And I hope that in what follows, I will show you some of the key points 
of theoretical demarcation in Augustine's work that are rich with implications for political theory and that avoid the reductionistic characterization of him. Now I will begin with Augustine on the self. The great historian of the late antique world, Peter Brown, claims that Augustine has come as near to us as the vast gulf that separates a modern man from the culture and religion of the later empire can allow. How so? One reason surely lies in Augustine's complex ruminations on the nature of selfhood, about which we have just heard uh, an interesting paper delivered. This is a theme close to our own preoccupations. <clears throat> Augustine, in fact, anticipates certain postmodern strategies in dethroning the Cartesian subject even before that subject got erected. For Augustine, the mind can never be transparent to itself. We are never wholly in control of our own thoughts. Our bodies are essential, not contingent, to who we are and how we think. And we know that we exist not because I think, therefore I am, but rather I doubt, therefore I know that I exist. Only a subject who is a self that, that can reflect on itself can doubt. Now the story for St. Augustine, and here too he is remarkable, begins with an infant. It's amazing that children don't appear for the most part in political theory. It's as if human beings spring full blown from the head of John Locke. <laughs> <laughs> so Augustine is radical within the context of political theory which often makes the assumption that we start as adults. Augustine begins with natality. He says we need to credit some of the stories that women tell about infants. He intimates a developmental account featuring a fragile, dependent creature who is by no means a tabula rasa, but a being at once social and quarrelsome. This little human being is driven by hunger, desire, and frustration at her inability to express herself and get others to respond. Now, growing up, he tells us, is not about getting rid of these childish emotions, for these are key ingredients of our natures and our ability to understand, but rather about forming and shaping our passions. Augustine's awareness of the sheer messiness of human existence lies at the heart of the withering critical fire he directs at Stoic apatheia. For the mind to be in a state, and these are quotes by the way, in which the mind cannot be touched by any emotion whatsoever, who would not judge this insensitivity to be the worst of all moral defects? We begin as and we remain beings who love and who yearn, who <laughs> grieve, who experience frustration, the most important point here is Augustine's insistence that thought can never be purged of the emotions and that the thinking self expresses complex emotions through thought and in a language that is hopefully up to the task. Epistemologically, thinking, including that mode of thinking called philosophic, should not pertain to a clean separation between emotion and reason. Rather, these are interlaced and mutually constitute one another. Augustine argues that certain philosophies abstract from or offer unreal assessments of our human condition by taking insufficient account of embodiment and should be rejected for that very reason. The body is epistemologically significant, a source of delight, of travail, of knowledge, of good and evil. The body is the mode in and through which we connect to the world and through which the world discloses itself. Mind is embodied, body is thought. The heart of Augustine's case against the Pelagians also lies here, given their overestimation of the control of human will, of voluntas. In the words of philosopher James Wetzel, Pelagius seemed in the end to deny that there were ever significant obstacles to living the good life once reason had illuminated its nature. Thus he stood in more obvious Pelagius and more obvious continuity with the philosophical tradition than Augustine, who came to disparage the worldly wisdom of pagan philosophy for its overconfidence. Augustine is, in some ways, an epistemological skeptic who believes, nonetheless, that we can come to know certain truths. There are warranted beliefs 
but we can approach these only through complex indirection and through love. A form desire and the name given to a good that spills over the boundaries of the self and reaches out to others and to the source of love, God. Now given the fact that all human beings are creatures attempting to express desire, whether disordered or ordered, and that they must do so through language, our words are open to misunderstanding and to multiple ambiguous interpretation by other similarly desiring creatures. Now this suggests a theory of language, and Augustine offers one, that influenced the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, among others. Because we are driven by delectio, by desire and yearning, we yearn for enjoyment, including the pleasures of the intellect. Indeed, we acquire self-knowledge by trying our strength in answering, not in word but in deed, what may be called the interrogation of temptation. We come to self-knowledge through our interaction with the world. But it is never easy for the mind to unlock things. As being circumscribed by the boundaries of time and space, we require certain fundamental categories in order to see the world at all. Otherwise, all would be flux. So in addition to time and space, we require a form that incorporates reason and will that is, so to speak, up to our complexity. And Augustine finds this in the Trinity, a principle that works through complex relational analogies involving similarities and dissimilarities, things seen and unseen at one and the same time. We are capable of forming concepts about things we have seen and things we have not seen. We imagine many things to be in part because we know what it means to have or to bear the trace of an image. We believe many things exist, rightly so, that are not personally known to us. Augustine writes, and in fact, when I wish to speak of Carthage, I seek for what to say within myself. Find an image of Carthage within myself, but I receive this through the body, that is, through the sense of the body, since I was present there in the body and have seen and perceived it with my senses and have retained it in my memory, that I might find the word about it within myself whenever I might wish to utter it. For its image in my mind is its word, not the sound of the three syllables when Carthage, Carthago in Latin, is named, or even when that name is silently thought of during some period of time. But the word that I see in my mind when I utter this word of three syllables of my voice, or even before I utter it, so too when I wish to speak of Alexandria, which I have never seen, an image of it is also present within me. So Augustine then goes on, I can't develop this point, to talk about the importance of trust and what it is we come to know. We have to take into account the observations of others. We can't be everywhere all the time. Augustine also uses the metaphor of fabrication, of making things, in order to drive this point home. A worker makes a chest. At first he has the chest in his skill knowledge, for if he did not have it excuse me, in his skill knowledge, how could it be brought forth by making? But the chest as it is in his skill knowledge is not the chest as it appears to our eyes. In skill knowledge it exists invisibly in the work it will exist visibly. When we gaze upon things in the mind through a complex word, name, image, nexus, we are not untrammeled in this imagining. There is an available repertoire. It is linguistic, historic, contingent, time-bound. It is caught within the confines and limits of our embodiment. So although naming and imagining is wonderful, it is also according to Augustine, constrained. We cannot imagine just anything. Now this leads directly to Augustine on language and the constraints, <coughs> excuse me, a bit of a cold, and the constraints imposed on this by language. As par excellence, the language users among God's creatures, we bump up all the time against opacity and constraint. In book 19, chapter 7, Augustine muses about the ways in which all humans are divided by linguistic differences. 
And these differences make it very hard for us to understand one another. And there's, <coughs> excuse me, it's a very famous passage, familiar to many of you, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, in which Augustine describes the situation in which two people encounter one another, but they don't know each other's language. And he goes on to say they can't communicate their thoughts. It is true that a man would be more cheerful with his dog for company uh, than with a foreigner because of the density of language and our inability to communicate. And then Augustine goes on to move from the murkiness of language, how it divides us, despite our common nature, to the imposition of a language on diverse peoples, but at a truly terrible price. And this is part of his critique of uh, the late Roman Empire. <coughs> we find then a drawing together of notions of human nature, language, and its centrality in constituting us as living creatures. The complexity of a search for fellowship and a pithy critique of the enforced homogeneity of empire. The upshot of the force of linguistic confession, con convention, sorry, finally, is that human beings can only achieve what Augustine calls creatures' knowledge. Full knowledge is not available to human knowers, no matter how brilliant and learned they may be. We are both limited and enabled by the conventions of language. No one can jump out of his or her linguistic skin. We are obliged to bow to what Augustine calls normal usage if we hope to communicate at all. And we are driven to communicate by our sociality, a sociality that goes all the way down. And this sociality lies at the basis of Augustine on the nature of human societies. So with that, <coughs> I will move to the next section, Augustine on social life. Oh, thank you. I'm getting mess in. Not by mess in, but Kleenex <coughs> up here. Thank you. you can, if anyone has medicine, you can bring it <coughs> <bring it forward. laughs> I'll take anything. Uh, human beings are, I know that above, social all the way down. Created in the image of God, human relationality defines us. The self is not and cannot be freestanding. Social life is full of ills and yet to be cherished. Thus, civic life, among those social forms, is not simply what sin has brought into the world, but what emerges in part given our capacity to love, our use of reason, as well, alas, as a pervasive lust for domination attendant upon human affairs. The philosophers hold the view that the life of the wise man should be social, and in this we support them heartily. Indeed, the city of God, Augustine's way of characterizing, as you know, the pilgrim band of Christians during their earthly sojourn in and through a community of reconciliation and fellowship that, as you also know, presages the heavenly kingdom, that city could never have had its first start, he tells us, if the life of the saints were not social. All human beings without exception are citizens of the earthly kingdom, the city of man. And even in this fallen condition, there is a kind of natural likeness that forges bonds between us. These bonds of peace do not suffice to prevent war, dissension, cruelty, and misery of all kinds. But we are nonetheless called to membership based on a naturalistic sociality and basic morality available to all God's rational creatures. A kind of unity in plurality pushes towards harmony, but the sin of division, with its origins in pride and willfulness, drives us apart. Yet it is love of friendship that lies at the root of what might be called Augustine's practical philosophy, its history, ethics, social, and political philosophy. Opinion between alienation and affection Human beings, those cracked pots, as he calls us, are caught in a tragedy of alienation, but glued by love. A sociality is a given. So for Augustine, the question is not, should we be social, or should we trust enough to love, but rather, what shall I love, and how shall I love it? His complex ethical theory follows, and can only be touched on here, but it must be noted that political life is one form 
that human social and ethical life assumes. We are always in society, and we always seek the consolation of others. Society, for Augustine, is a species of friendship, and friendship is a moral union in and through which human beings strive for a shared good. All of Augustine's central categories, including war and peace, are in the form of relation of one sort or another. And the more we are united at all levels in a bond of peace, the closer we come to achieving that good at which we aim and which God intends. For Augustine, neighborliness and reciprocity emerge from ties that bond, beginning with familial bonds and extending from these particular relations outward. The filaments of affection, however, must not and do not stop at the portal to the domes. Augustine writes, the aim was that one man should not combine many relationships in his own self, but that those connections should be separated and spread among individuals, and that in this way, they should help to bind social life more effectively by involving in their plurality a plurality of persons. The social tie is then not confined to a small group, but extends more widely to a large company with multiplying kinds of kinship. The importance of plurality, of the many emerging from a unique one, for God began with singular, cannot be underestimated in Augustine's work. It is his way of putting into a single frame human uniqueness and individuality with sociality and plurality. Bonds of affection tied human beings from the start, and bonds of kinship and affection bound them further. Now, in light of the confusion and confounding of human languages, it is sometimes difficult to repair to this fundamental sociality. But we yearn for it and we seek it in and through the, so in and through the social forms we create. Thus, civic order, a primary requisite for human existence, is one example. This civic order is a normative good, although, in opposition to Aristotle, civic order, or what we today call the state, does not fulfill and complete our natures. Rather, it reflects them and may do so in ways that are deadly or less cruel. Here is it, it is important to note that for Augustine, no human being, no human being, has natural domination over any other. There is no slavery by nature. We are by nature social, but that does not dictate any particular form of social order. Nor does Augustine, as do many later theorists, he doesn't analogize from the authority of fathers in the household to political rule. Classical patriarchal theory holds that the rule by fathers is at once both natural and political, and that a natural right translates into political authority. But for Augustine, political authority is different from familial authority. To the extent that one is subject to a ruler, one is subject to him in status only and not by nature. Now, <coughs> there are temporal rules that are worthy. I have to skip over some of this section, I think, in the interest of time. Uh, but let me just say that uh, during the course of his discussion of the nature of commonwealths, Augustine finds fault with Cicero's understanding of a civic order as refracted through the writings of Scipio, uh, and goes on to say that a commonwealth, his own understanding, is that people gather together in a civic order, a multitude of rational beings united in fellowship by sharing a common love of the same things. That is, the commonwealth isn't just glued by self-interest, but by shared loves. Now using this definition, we not only can define what a society is, but we can also assess <coughs> what it is that people hold dear. We can ask ourselves the question, um, what sort of society is this? What kind of community is this? What do people care about? It is worth noting at this juncture that a debate in current Augustinian scholarship concerns precisely how one should rank the good of political society for Augustine. Now, the traditional and overly simple view claimed that civic order is simply a remedy for sin. And that view, I believe, has now been effectively challenged. 
Now the question seems to be just how important to Augustine's thought overall is the good at which civic life tends, and how much this derives from and can be achieved through the exercise of human <coughs> excuse me, voluntary activity. The dangers in Arab within earthly political life are manifest, the fruits of pride that seek domination over others and glories only in the self or the empire. The goods to be attained through civic life are sketchier, but begin with Augustine's basic rule of thumb for human earthly life, namely that we should avoid harm and help whenever we can. Now it is the interplay of caritas and cupiditas that is critical and whether one or the other prevails in a given point of time, whether within the very being of a single person or the life of a civic order. Augustine would tame the occasions for the reign of cupiditas and the activation of the libido dominandi less to dominate and maximize the space within which caritas operates. For a less to domination taints and perverts all human relations from family to city. Similarly, a decent love, a concern for the well-being of all in the household or in the city, strengthens the delicate filaments of peace. The sin that mars the earthly city is the story of arbitrary power or the ever-present possibility of such. By contrast, the basis for a more just social order is fueled by love. The theme of the two cities, then, is I'm sure many of you know, is a metaphor that enables Augustine to trace the geography of human relations. Every human community is plagued, he tells us, by a poverty-stricken kind of power, a scramble for domination and for honors. But there is simultaneously present the life-forgiving and gentler aspects of loving concern, mutuality, domestic, and civic peace. So there are two fundamentally different attitudes events within human social life and enacted by human beings. One attitude is a powerful feeling of the fullness of life. A human being will not be denuded if he or she gives or makes a gift of the self to others. One's dependence on others is not a diminution but an enrichment of the self. The other attitude springs from cramped and cribbed selfishness, resentment, a penury of spirit. The way one reaches down or out to others from these different attitudes is perforce strikingly different. From a spirit of resentment and contempt, one condescends <laughs> towards the other, one is hostile to life itself. But from that fellow feeling in our hearts for the misery of others, we come to their help by coming together with them. Authentic compassion eradicates contempt and distance. But this working out can never achieve anything like perfection in the realm of earthly time and history. In Robert Marcus's book, Sacalum, which is widely acknowledged as one of the most important attempts to unpack and situate Augustine as a civic and political thinker, he argues that Augustine aimed for a number of complex things with his characterization of the two cities. One was to sort out the story of all earthly cities. Augustine, he argues, provides an account of the earthly city from Assyria through Rome and shows the ways in which even the cherished goal of peace all too often ends in domination, which is no real peace at all. The fullness of peace is reserved for the heavenly city and its eternal peace, of course, but intimations can be achieved on this earth. So in this way, Augustine creates barriers to the absolutizing of any political arrangement. Marcus goes on to tell us that Augustine's repudiation of the theology underwriting the notions of an imperium Christianum lies in part in his word that the identification of the city of God with an earthly order invites sacralization of human arrangements and a dangerous idolatry. At the same time, earthly institutions do have a claim on us, and our membership in a polity is not reducible to misery and punishment. So temporal peace is a good amidst the shadows that hover over and among us. There are two rules that I've already mentioned. First, to do no harm, and second, to help whenever possible. So the most just human civic arrangements are those that afford the widest scope 
to the non-harm way and fellowship and mutuality. If mutuality, even of the earthly imperfect sort, is to be attained, there must be a compromise between human wills, which is really <clears throat> Augustine's definition of human political life. A compromise between human wills and the earthly city must find a way to forge bonds of peace. This she finds very difficult by definition, given the distortions of the lust to dominate. By contrast, the heavenly city on earthly pilgrimage is better able to forge peace by calling out citizens from all nations and so collects a society of aliens speaking all languages. And the Chiritas Dei does this not by annulling or abolishing earthly differences, but even through maintaining them so long as God can be worshipped. Now, I have another whole section on Augustine on War and Peace, which I'm going to have to really just skip over in the interest of time and move to my conclusion. I believe the full papers will be available at some point, so <clears throat> you'll be able to read what I have to say here if you're interested. The vast mountain of Augustinian scholarship keeps growing. <clears throat> it long ago surpassed a book version of Mount Everest, so much so that no single scholar or group of scholars could possibly master it. One always has the sense with Augustine that one is just scratching the surface. Much of the new scholarship on Augustine remarks, often with a sense of critical wonderment, on just how contemporary he is, for many reasons. But one frequently cited is the collapse in our own time of political utopianism, by which I mean attempts to order political and social life under an overarching Weltanschauung that begins, as any such attempt must, with a flawed anthropology about human malleability and even perfectibility achieved, to be achieved through politics. We, re <coughs> Excuse me. we recognize, looking back, the mounds of bodies on which such political projects rest. Uh, teleologies of the sort of onward and upward sort of historic progress are no longer believable, although a version of this sort of thing um, has emerged, um, touted by voluptuaries of techno progress or genetic engineering hopes that we may yet perfect the human race, this time biologically, or through various techniques. The presumably solid underpinnings of the self gave way in the 20th century under the onslaughts of Nietzsche and Freud. Cultural anthropology taught lessons of cultural contingencies. Contemporary students of rhetoric have discovered the importance and vitality of rhetoric and the ways in which all of our political and social life and thought must be cast and available linguistic forms. None of this would have surprised Augustine. What would, I think, sadden him is the human propensity to substitute one extreme for another. For example, a too thoroughgoing account of disembodied reason giving way to a too thoroughgoing account of reason's demise. Importantly, one must rescue Augustine from those who would appropriate him to a version of realpolitik and the world of political theory. That situated, situated him there, downplays his insistence on the great virtue of hope and the call to enact projects of caritas. That does not mean that Augustine can be called to service unambiguously in behalf of markets and democracy. It does mean that he should not be listed as one of the depredators of humankind. Thank you very much. Sorry for my malaise up here, but I hope you understand. I hope you understood me. Um, any questions now? I have a chance later. But I don't see any, so uh, I will. I will tell you as I tell my students. Just think about it, and you can <laughs> give me some questions later. So, thanks very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website 
divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.